Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Oscar-nominated cinematographer Robbie Ryan, who has teamed up with director Yorgos Lanthimos once again for Poor Things, released December 8th this year. Robbie, the last time you teamed up with Yorgos on The Favorite, you both scored Oscar nominations. So what about working with him brings out the best in you? Ooh, well, it's always a, a new day with Yorgos. You just don't know what's coming next. And I think that is the exciting part of it, that you kind of... Um, you just know that it's going to be an amazing experience and an amazing challenge. And uh, he's kind of like, I always say he's like a master cinematographer himself. So I'm always catching up basically. And this film, it's it's such a visual spectacle in so many ways. There's the costumes, production design, hair and makeup, but the cinematography is also like its own character. It's, you know, stunning from and and unique in in a lot of ways from the films we see what did you and Yorgos discuss as the goal for how you wanted this film to just look uh well we always film on you know 35 millimeters so that's something that we wanted to do from the start and I think you know that sensibility is something that kind of lands with the rest of it as well where you've kind of got um a whole sort of universe that is unique and Yorgos is kind of um he, he wanted to create a world for Bella to be in that nobody else would see only through her eyes and I think his visual sort of sensibility was that the world would be quite wild as far as her visual so that was able to help lens have these kind of interesting lens choices you know and we did the favorite and Yorgos likes a wide lens so I knew that would probably feature a little bit in this one, but um, <clears throat> what was different about this one in a way was that we did an awful lot of zooming in the film and it kind of was a, a new challenge for me in that respect. So I learned a lot as we were in prep. We had like a long prep uh, sort of process on this film and it was great. Every day you go in and you sort of see the, the, being, the, the sets being built around you. So it kind of had a, a way of sort of infusing into me and like the osmosis of all this set building and like going into, I had like an, an office day job every day for about 12 weeks. And I remember kind of sitting in my office going, oh, wow, this is what it looks like in an office. And Yorgos would have his office next to me. So we'd kind of drop in and I'd pass by and go, oh, how's it going? And we talk, probably just talked more about photography than anything, like because he was he just kind of gotten a beautiful large format camera that he was taking stills with, and you know he just showed me pictures he was taking with that, and you go, wow, that looks great, and you know it, it was a it was a very nice relaxed type uh, pre production as such, and I think that helped kind of create it uh, be a bit more eased into the shooting of it, whereas sometimes you don't have that kind of freedom to just walk onto a film set and see it being built, you know, and we we did an awful lot of uh, the prep kind of testing on on the London set as it was getting built. So, you know, there's like a really lovely uh, test we did on VistaVision, I think, where the whole set was painted white because they hadn't started painting the interior of the set yet. So like, I look back at some of those recently and it's like, wow, it was kind of, it was really a special kind of process to kind of be on a, 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 a you know, a, a a set that was getting more and more alive by the day, you know? Yeah, I got to speak with the production designers and they were talking about sort of the massive scale and and how immersive it was. Was that different for you as a cinematographer, just to be sort of, I mean, it, it, it seemed like you were in the city in, in many ways. And, and how do you make, how do you make winter in London when it's summer in Hungary? <laughs> that is a good question. Let me answer the first one. Yeah, you know, what's great, like for me, this film was a huge jump in the sort of world I would be used to on a film set. I usually do location stuff with not many lights, da 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 So this was like a, a studio film. And the great thing about that was it kind of still felt like we were on a location because they just built the locations in like this amazing detail. So everything in front of the camera is there. We didn't, it was like the same approach I would do normally. It's just, I had to do a lot more lights and the London set was always going to be, this one will be okay. Cause this is, that was built outside. So we, we won't have to have so many lights for that one, but all the stuff inside had to have lights and we had to build skies inside all of these other sort of cities like Paris and Lisbon. And that was like, I knew that was going to cost a lot because we're going to have to get hundreds and hundreds of lights. But turns out the summer in, in Hungary was really sunny. And 
were meant to be filming rainy London. So we had to get these huge, big kind of crane uh, frames. So we had two like 150 foot sort of um, sort of diffusion frames over the street. And like that's they looked big. They were big. They were really expensive and they still didn't cover the full street. So you're like, move it over that way a bit, move it over that way a bit. And it, it took a lot of time and it was really kind of like I was like, oh, I can't believe this is going to this is harder than the, the lighting stuff is, you know, so. I guess a lot of cinematographers like the idea of being inside a studio because they have control and in a way being like the coming from a location shooting background as I do, I thought the outside one would be easier, but it actually turned out to be probably more kind of complex. One of the uh, coolest effects for me is there's, there's certain shots where it's, it's <clears> like <throat> rounded. It looks like you're almost looking through a peephole or, um, or a magnifying glass. What was, what was the, decision and, and choice behind that and and how do you achieve that effect yeah that one was a, an extension of the wide angle like language yorgos has been kind of developing over other films and he kind of wanted i think there's a there's old old vintage photography where you would see a lot of that vignette sort of kind of effect because the big plate cameras that would have been used in early uh, photography had like a lens that didn't cover the full sort of width of the the glass plate that would have been used for the the, the camera. So I think Jorgis like had a bit of an sort of an interest in trying to recreate that to an extent. And uh, he did say he wants to try and get this vignette thing. And I was going, well, well, why don't we try and get a 16 millimeter lens and use it on a 35 millimeter camera? Because the, the, by the nature of that lens, it won't be able to cover the full sort of negative space. And luckily, this four millimeter lens we got uh, did just that. It literally created this sort of like peephole, as you call it, in in the negative. So it it really gives this feeling that you're looking into a world and you can almost step into the world because it's such a wide angle world you're looking at that you kind of you kind of like you, you do tend to kind of go, oh, what's going on? Who's that character? And it's like because it's so kind of like dense an image, you know? I want to talk a little bit about the opening shot as well. Um, it's it's Emma Stone, and at the at the time she's like this mystery woman. She's she's dressed in like this elegant blue outfit, and she looks troubled. We don't really know what's going on with this person, um, but it's really beautifully shot. And then right after that, we cut to to black and and white soon after. So what goes into um, making that decision to make that bold first shot? before we transition into black and white? Well, there's a true honest honest answer, and I'm going to say it. I'll probably get into trouble for saying it, but it's basically because everybody, if they saw a black and white image at the beginning of the film, might think the whole film was going to be black and white. So Jorgos was conscious of that, and he said, I think if we put a colour shot in at the start, everybody would think it's a colour film, and then it goes to black and white. Oh, hopefully it'll go to colour again. So that was sort of the theory behind that. But we... What was what also is nice about that is it's sort of a flashback at the beginning of the film because we don't we go straight back into another into the story of Bella as she is now in black and white. So what I love about the use of color and black and white in the film is that usually when you sort of maybe see a film, flashbacks might be in black and white, but in this film the film is in black and white and then the flashbacks come and they're in colour. So essentially it's still a flashback, even though it's the beginning of the film and the titles are also in colour as well. So um, we could have got away with it maybe and nobody would have known the difference. But I think that was the that was a little bit of the thinking behind that. But I, I guess more so story-wise, it's a flashback of her jumping and um, that would have been the rationale. What is it? Like as a cinematographer, how does it impact you, uh, the actors that you're working with? Because you're with Emma Stone, Willem Dafoe, Mark Ruffalo. And this cast is really phenomenal. Does that, does, do you feel the difference on set when, when you have such a seasoned, accomplished cast? Does it allow you like freedom to try different things? Or what is it like just working with that cast? Absolutely amazing. I think what's great for the cast that was assembled is that they, they, we're kind of relearning a little bit themselves. Everything on a yoga set is sort of a different sort of approach. And they really embraced this sort of new kind of way of 
being together and like they do this crazy rehearsal sequence or like I like two week rehearsal process before the filming begins. And I think it's a great um, way for them to break down any barriers that they might have had or thoughts about the character because Yorgos just wants to have fun. And he kind of like, yeah, like let's see what happens here. You, you know, your character might, you know, what, what would your character do? He lets everybody sort of like delve into their own sort of, um, you know, idea of what that person is but at the same time hoping that he would go oh that's really good where he doesn't do that he just goes oh i didn't know you're gonna be like that okay and um i think what's great about that is that you really have a a real great nascent energy about the way the the whole thing's gonna go you just there's a there was a real sort of palpable energy about these actors working off each other with really interesting characters you know and like you know Rami Youssef's character is kind of very much the straight guy, even though he's a comedian in his day job, that he's sort of, he's playing the straight character and everybody else is kind of wild around him. And the, the, just the richness about all of it is really, uh, it's wonderful to watch because the script is so strong and it, it kind of makes these characters alive before they've even got in front of the camera, you know? And how do you work with or around visual effects, particularly in this film where they're so integrated? I mean, we have um birds with dog heads walking around <laughs> it's it's just cr- it's wild stuff i love it so much um what how do you work with or around those types of elements in the film sure well that is an interesting i forgot about goose willis yeah that was our dog <laughs> and oops. um and the the vfx guy on that our our guy who's like our supervisor on the set was sweating quite a lot on those scenes because the way Jorgis wanted to film this is, well, I'm filming it like this and that's that's the way it's going to be. Whereas if you were to ask a VFX person, how should we film this? They go, well, could you do this and do this? And none of that sits with the Jorgis universe. It's not going to be done that way. So we shot it exactly like we shot everything else. And they had to kind of like do the magic in their own way and make, you know, probably had a very difficult journey getting it to that place. But I thought they did an amazing job. Uh, but they had to sort of like adapt to our way of filming and uh, we didn't change any way of filming at all. What was it like when you think back um, to the favorite a little bit, getting that Oscar nomination? What was that whole process like for you and and going, you know, do do you have any like wild memories or someone you met there and you're like, I just can't believe I'm hanging out with this person or what was that whole process like for you? Oh, it was great. Yeah, I I kind of, I, I... had no idea of the amount of um, sort of promotional things you have to do and the journey you go on. And then I remember the day I got the, the nominations came out, I was working and uh, I got a, I got a pencil for a job with Yorgos actually on the day that that uh, Oscar nomination was announced. And it was for a, uh, a female sanitary uh, towel commercial that we were going to do. So I was like, this is just so bizarre. I get like nomination for an Oscar at the same time York is doing this sort of commercial for sanitary towels. So or like for uh, they're for um you know um incontinence. That was it. Wow. <laughs> so that was that was a pretty like unusual thing to be getting on the same day as the Oscar nomination to get a pencil for that. Uh, and then when we got to the Oscars, it was it was wild. It's like a it's like a crazy circus. I I I had an idea of what it was going to be like, and then it 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 was some on top of that as well. And you know, uh, I brought my sister along, and we just had a great time. And you know, the thing I I didn't expect was the the people who sit fill your seats. That was the thing that I kind of found really interesting. It's when you go to the toilet somebody's there to take your seat while you're at the toilet so it looks like there's a really packed house and my sister was like you know she I dropped something down under the seat and she had to try and get something like it was my wallet actually she had to get the wallet out of the seat but her hand got stuck so she couldn't get her hand out and the person waiting to get on the seat was like going I need to sit on the seat and she's like I know but I can't move my hand (laughs) she wrenched it out finally and then the person got to sit down and it was all okay so yeah just those memories are like well I kind of I kind of like they're bizarre it it was a it's a bizarre um crazy show and I I I I enjoyed it thoroughly well I hope you get more bizarre crazy moments this year (laughs) because I I I love this movie so much. Um, it just blows me away. I, I saw it twice and it's um, congratulations on your stunning work. Best of luck to you this awards season. And Robbie, thanks for hanging out and chatting about poor things today. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. 